How are substances classified? Recall from the last chapter that matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. Matter is classified into two groups, pure substances and mixtures. Now, we'll talk about mixtures a little bit later. For now, we want to concentrate on pure substances. Pure substances can be elements or compounds. Here we have an example of an element. It is pure sodium metal. And here we have an example of a compound, which is calcium carbonate, which is a major component of seashells. An element is the simplest type of pure substance. And elements consist of one kind of atom. So all of the elements are listed here on the periodic table. Elements cannot be broken down into simpler substances. Again, we said that an element is the simplest type of pure substance and it consists of only one type of atom. So for example, here we have carbon. So the element carbon consists of only carbon atoms. The element oxygen consists of only oxygen atoms. The element gold consists of only gold atoms. So each element is composed of a different type of atom. Now, elements are arranged on the periodic table by atomic number. The atomic number is this number here, usually above the element symbol. And right here we have the element symbol. This number we'll talk about later. If we go back to the periodic table, we'll see that the elements are arranged by atomic number and they increase going from left to right and from top to bottom. So for example, an element that has an atomic number of 26 is right here and it is called iron. Oxygen has an atomic number of 8. Fluorine, an atomic number of 9, and gold, an atomic number of 79. Problem. An element has atomic number 16. What is the identity of the element? Well, we have to look that up on the periodic table. We go to the periodic table and we look up atomic number 16, which is right here. And it turns out the element is sulfur. So the atomic number helps us identify an element. Now, let's go ahead and talk a little more detail about these terms here. Atoms, elements, and elemental. You can think of an element as the name of a certain type of atom. As we said, the element carbon is made up of carbon atoms. The element oxygen is made up of oxygen atoms. The word elemental describes the most stable physical state that an element exists under normal conditions, normal temperatures and normal pressures. So for example, elemental carbon exists as a number of six-membered carbon rings that are fused together, producing extensive sheets which form layers. The atom is the smallest particle of an element that still retains all of the characteristics of that element. When we discuss element, we are referring to the atoms of the element in their most stable form. So here are a few new terms, monatomic, diatomic, tetratomic, octatomic, and so on. So for example, elemental sodium is monatomic. And most of our elements are monatomic. So sodium occurs in nature as a collection of individual sodium atoms. And that's the case for most of the elements, but there are some exceptions. For example, elemental oxygen is what we call diatomic. That means that in its most stable form, two oxygen atoms are linked together. And then elemental phosphorus is what we call tetratomic. And phosphorus in its most stable elemental form will occur in groupings of four phosphorus atoms. For example, sulfur. Sulfur is octatomic. 
and that's because it occurs as a collection of eight sulfur atoms. There are seven elements that occur as diatomic species, and you should memorize those. And here they're highlighted in yellow. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So for example, on the periodic table, the symbol for oxygen is a capital O. But when we refer to the elemental form of oxygen, the symbol is a capital O with a subscript. And again, that's because the most stable form of oxygen is as a diatomic molecule. Now, let's take a look at the periodic table. The way the periodic table is organized allows us to predict physical and chemical properties of the elements. And that's just based on the position of the element on the periodic table. Again, as I said, elements are ordered by atomic number. Atomic numbers increase going from left to right and from top to bottom. Now, the horizontal rows of the periodic table are called periods. The columns are called groups. It turns out that elements within a group display similar chemical activity. And we'll see why that is in chapter 3. Elements in periods tend to have different chemical activities. So let's see. Calcium is an element in period 4 and group 2A. Notice that there are two numbering systems for the groups. In the newer numbering system, the groups are numbered 1 through 18. In the other number system, we have groups 1A, 2A, and then we go over here, group 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, and 8A. And then these here are the B groups. This is the numbering system that I am going to use, and you'll see why a little later. For example, chlorine is in group 7A, period 3. Gold is in period 6, here's gold, group 1B. Now, the A groups are called the main group elements, also called representative elements. So groups 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, and 8A are the main group or representative elements. Group 1A elements, lithium, sodium, potassium, are called the alkali metals. Hydrogen is not a metal. We'll find later it's a nonmetal. In group 2A, we have magnesium, calcium, and so on. These are called the alkaline earth metals. Group 7A, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. These are called the halogens. And group 8A, we have helium, neon, argon, krypton. These are called the noble gases. The elements highlighted in green in this section here are called the transition elements. Transition elements are all solids with the exception of mercury. Mercury is a liquid at normal temperatures and pressures. These two rows at the bottom are called the inner transition elements. These are all metals and the first row is called the lanthanide series, and the second row is called the actinide series. Let's take a look as to why. Notice that the atomic number for cerium is 58. Well, look at this. Here we have cesium, which is 55, barium, which is 56, and then lanthanum, is 57. Notice that next to lanthanum there's an atomic number of 72. But no, actually after lanthanum is C2. 
deuterium, and so on, all the way to atomic number 71. And then we come back up here and continue numbering. The actinide series, notice radium is atomic number 88, actinum is 89, and then we go down here to thorium, which is 90, all the way through 103, and then back up here to 104. We'll explain why again in Chapter 3. Of the actinide series, only the first three, thorium, protactinium, and uranium, occur naturally. All of these other elements are synthesized in a laboratory. Now, Let's go ahead and take a look at how the periodic table is divided into metals, nonmetals, and semi-metals or metalloids. Okay? All of these elements in orange are metals. So the periodic table mainly contains metals. There are a lot more metals than nonmetals. In blue-green, we have the nonmetals, and that includes hydrogen. So all of these, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, helium, these are all nonmetals. And then in this lime green, we have the metalloids or the semi-metals. So let's talk about the metals first. Metals have very illustrious surfaces. Metals can conduct heat and electricity. They're malleable, and they're ductile. By malleable, we mean that we can pound them into shapes. And by ductile, we mean that they can be formed into wires, like, for example, copper. We use copper in our electrical wires. All of the metals are solids except for mercury, which is a liquid. Let's take a look at the nonmetals. The nonmetals are in this blue-green. And nonmetals exist as solids, liquids, and gases. So, for example, carbon is a solid. Nitrogen and oxygen are gases. Fluorine and chlorine are gases. Um, we have sulfur, which is a solid. Iodine is a solid. And so we have all of these here. Remember, group 8A are the noble gases. So these are all gases. So they exist as solids, liquids, and gases. Nonmetals tend to have dull surfaces, the solids do, and they're poor conductors of heat and electricity. And the solids happen to be very, very brittle. The metalloids, or semi-metals, and these are colored in green, those include boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, tellurium, polonium, and astatine. Uh, these semi-metals or metalloids have characteristics and properties that overlap in both metals and nonmetals. They have variable conductivities and some of these are used as semiconductors. Silicon is a good example of a semiconductor that you might be familiar with. Now, let's talk about compounds. Compounds are represented by chemical formulas. A compound is defined as a pure substance that consists of more than one type of atom. So, for example, carbon monoxide. We have baking soda here, also called sodium bicarbonate. Water. Sodium chloride, table salt. And here we have calcium carbonate. And, of course, there are many, many other compounds. Remember that the chemical formulas for a compound indicate the type and number of each atom in the compound. Recall that the subscripts in the chemical formula indicate the number of each type of atom in the compound. Where we don't see a subscript, we assume a 1. So, for example, sodium bicarbonate or baking soda contains one sodium atom, one atom of hydrogen, one atom of carbon, and three oxygen atoms. Compounds have a constant composition. So in other words, the atoms are combined in a fixed ratio. 
So for example, the chemical formula H2O refers to water. Here we have H2O2, and that is hydrogen peroxide. Capital C, capital O is carbon monoxide, and CO2 is carbon dioxide. So carbon monoxide is a very different compound from carbon dioxide. And water is very different from hydrogen peroxide. Compounds can be chemically broken down into simpler substances. For example, water can be chemically broken down into its component elements, hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, we do this in a reaction called electrolysis, and we place these electrodes into the water, okay, and apply a uh, voltage, and the water molecules will break down into molecular oxygen and molecular hydrogen. Baking soda, if we heat it, will decompose to sodium carbonate, water, and carbon dioxide. So the point here is compounds can be chemically broken down into simpler substances. Either compounds, like in the case of baking soda, it decomposes to three new compounds, or elements. In the case of water, it can be broken down into elemental hydrogen and elemental oxygen. Summary. Pure substances exist as either elements or compounds. Elements cannot be broken down into simpler substances. Compounds can be broken down into simpler or elemental components. Each pure substance has its own unique set of physical properties. Melting points, boiling point, density, conductivity, color.